Okay, hi everyone. Yeah, uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm Will Stevens, and uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Jayu Ruan. Uh, we work uh, in Intel's Silicon Security Group. Uh, we're responsible for the architecture uh, and design choices for our silicon roots of trust in our data center products, in our GPU products, uh, and in some of our client products. Um, so, uh, we're one, just you know, thank you for uh, your participation here. Uh, thank you for uh, you know, attending and listening to our talk. We hope that um, it's, our, our ideas are shared and our ideas can be you know, moved forward through uh, uh, this talk. Um, so uh, one of the things that Intel is, is really you know, uh, supportive of and, and Jiayu and I and others in our team are very supportive of are uh, the way that um, standards are driven. We really like how the OCP Summit, many of the talks here are uh, driving collaboration through standardization, right? We think that that's you know, a, a real boon towards uh, different firmware and hardware vendors supplying um, solutions that deliver good interoperability for all of our partners. Um, you know, our, ourselves, we work uh, through many of the standards, uh, such as the TCG DICE working group that also drives the DPE uh, specification development um, uh, through uh, the TPM working groups. Uh, Jiayu uh, is a main contributor of the SPDM uh, specification uh, that's leading to many of the use cases that are talked about in this summit. Um, for both attestation and key agreement you know, with devices. Uh, our particular topic um, that we have here today that we thought we'd just you know, bring and share is uh, looking at that standards-based approach to solve you know, a, a particular issue around seamless updates and enable you know, better uh, data center management through um, seamless updates. So for uh, seamless updates is kind of a terminology that we use in Intel uh, to do runtime updates of firmware uh, without having to reboot the server, right? And um, today, I, well, you know that uh, Intel processors have had micro patches for years and years and years that can be applied as an OS-based uh, update to the microcode firmware, which is very relevant from a security point of view. Uh, we're expanding that towards other firmware, such as our SOC firmware um, that does you know, CPU-related uh, power management, uh, and even our silicon roots of trust as well, to be able to up the, update those at runtime. Um, so uh, for that type of solution, in order to uh, provide both the attestation of the update and attestation of you know, what happened before so that a server or backend can evaluate it, uh, we thought we'd share you know, a, a, how we think of solving that problem with a standards-based uh, PKI approach. There are other approaches, right? So um, we think that as part of OCP, we're gonna collaborate and hopefully we'll build a standards um, solution that, we're, that we could all align on. So I'm gonna turn it over now to, uh, to Jia Yu, who's gonna walk us through many of the details. Thanks, Will. Um, so the problem we are trying to solve is the uh, testation of the uh, seamless update. Um, so we use multiple terminologies here. At Intel, we call it seamless update or runtime update. Calypcha calls it a helix update. So this is to replace the runtime firmware um, in memory without resetting the system. As we know, resetting the system in data center is very expensive. Uh, the downtime is really expensive, so we try to avoid that as much as we can. But we need to do phone update to uh, fix security issues or introduce new features, uh, either security hardening features or functional uh, new features. So the reasons we have to do seamless update here. And the update may happen multiple times in a power cycle. We could put to firmware A and update to firmware B and then update to firmware C where firmware B could be a uh, vulnerable firmware. We can also do firmware A to B and back to firmware A if that's allowed by policy. 
Um, so we noticed that the uh, security posture of the system is not only dependent on the current firmware. The history matters here. Um, say uh, firmware B, which was previously run on this system, may have performed some malicious configurations on hardware, such as turning off some uh, uh, hardware features. Um, that would impact the current firmware security posture. So um, it's required that we would also be able to uh, attest to not only the current firmware um, using SPDM, for example, but also the history of the update in this power cycle. So that's the problem we're trying to resolve. Uh, we try to um, record this uh, firmware update history by not introducing any new mechanisms. We try to uh, record the firmware identities, the firmware error run on this uh, power cycle within the current PKI S509 framework. Um, so there are two issues we need to resolve here. First is how do we encode the firmware identity into a certificate? Um, there are two ways I can think of to uh, encode the uh, firmware identity into the uh, certificate. First one is we are all familiar with DICE. So DICE has this very nice extension called DICE TCP Info. Um, this is an uh, extension defined by uh, DICE, TCG DICE, and it can hold multiple different components of the FOIA ID, such as SVN, hash, all that. It's not a standard PKI defining the RFC 5280, but it's an add-on by the DICE uh, TCG spec. And another uh, way we can encode the firmware identity into the s 509 certificate would be in the serial number. Um, this is a standard PKI defining the RFC 5280. But the limitation is that there's only uh, 160 bits uh, allowed by this serial number. So it may be too tight if you want to hold a uh, hash, for example, of the firmware. But it's good enough if you want to identify the firmware by a version number or the uh, security version number, SVN, or par partial of the uh, firmware digest, or a combination of them. Um, so our method would support both of these uh, recording methods for the firmware identity. Um, so this diagram will show the high level how do we record the firmware uh, identity into the searching. Very straightforward. Um, we will keep increasing the searching as we do firmware updates. Uh, every firmware update would add one cert to the chain, and the leaf cert is always reflecting the current firmware that's running. And the intermediate firmware, the intermediate CA certs would represent the identities of the uh, previously run firmware. Uh, they are no longer running right now, but they were, they were run on this system in this power cycle. So at boot, the device ID cert, which never changes on a device, would issue a uh, leaf search for firmware A, which is the boot time firmware loaded from flash. And if we run a firmware update, seamless update from A to B, then uh, uh, the ROM would, or, or the uh, FMC, wherever uh, you want to choose, um, would issue an intermediate cert for firmware A that tells the verifier that firmware A was running here. And then the intermediate, firmware, uh, intermediate CA firmware A would issue a cert, leaf cert for firmware B which is the current firmware. And if you, again, update to firmware C, then firmware B would have an intermediate CA. Um, then firmware C would become the leaf, CA, uh, the leaf cert in this case. So that's the way we uh, record the uh, history within the search chain. This is completely uh, S509 compliant. Um, so I just mentioned there are two problems we need to resolve. First one is uh, recording of the firmware identity. Second issue we need to resolve is the revocation. Um, with the uh, CRL mechanism, the uh, S509 has defined a pretty nice uh, revocation mechanism here. Um, with CRL mechanism, which is compliant with S509 PKI, we can also use that to uh, revoke either devices uh, or the uh, certificates. So we maintain three CRLs here. The first CRL would revoke the uh, individual devices, uh, device ID certs. Say if a device has, uh, um, has been compromised, its UDS may be uh, extracted by some advanced attacker, then we will put that device uh, ID cert in the CRL1. So this is individual devices being revoked. And the CRL2 and CRL3 are for revoking uh, vulnerable firmware 
versions, identities. The difference is, is that uh, we use CIL2 to revoke the firmware with vulnerability um, only when the vulnerability, uh, only if the vulnerability is harmful when the firmware is running. Um, so you can see this diagram. CIL2 is really pointing to the leaf cert. So we consider there are there may be two types of vulnerabilities, right? First one is if only if the firmware is running, this vulnerability can be exploited to uh, compromise the system. The second type would be CIL3. That's a more severe vulnerability. In this case, the vulnerability may be harmful even if the firmware is no longer running, but it was run on this system before. So in that case, we will put such firmware in the CIL3 and revoke it in CIL3. Um, so with all these three CILs, we cover all the possibilities of uh, compromise on the system. Um, for the CIL2 and 3, uh, they are for the firmware identity. So really, if one firmware version is compromised or vulnerable, we will just add a single entry in the CIL. So we maintain the CIL size pretty small. Uh, as long as the firmware is running on uh, multiple, even millions of systems, but they're running the same firmware ID, so we just use a single entry in the CIL203. And this is completely compliant with the uh, PKI infrastructure. Um, a little bit details on how ROM handles this uh, certificate and key generation. Um, so what, what, when the ROM boots, it will verify the firmware A, the bootstrap firmware from Flash, and it would uh, derive a private, uh, the uh, leaf private key from the ROM seed and the firmware A's ID and the label. The label could be a constant or can be random. Um, so in this case, the ROM seed could be UDS itself or it could be a derivation from the UDS and the bootstrap firmware identity. And it doesn't really have to be handled by ROM. It could be handled by uh, FMC, for example. Um, of course, the advantage of not using UDS is that it's a higher security bar, so you don't have to open UDS at every uh, silly update or silly update here. Um, in addition to the uh, leaf private key and cert, um, the ROM would also derive intermediate private key for A, for firmware A, uh, with the same parameters but a different label. So in this case, um, every firmware that ROM or, or FMC loads, it would generate two certs for that firmware. One leaf cert, which is for the currently running firmware, and also intermediate cert for in case the firmware is to be updated to firmware B or the next firmware. Um, yeah, so notice that in this case, the ROM's flow is pretty uh, streamlined. So when there's a firmware update uh, happen between five and six, the ROM would, or FMC would verify the new firmware, and it would go back to step two and generate the two certs, two private keys and two certs for the new firmware again. Um, this diagram shows the uh, key accessibility and the certificate storage. So one question we get is, um, uh, with this scheme, the searching could become pretty large if there are many seamless updates happening. Um, uh, so we don't have to store the entire searching on the SOC or the ROT. Uh, all these intermediate certs could be stored in um, host, for example. Uh, so it doesn't have to be stored on die, uh, which has a very expensive uh, SRAM memory, of course. Um, and the private keys, we only need to store the ROM seed or FMC seed, wherever seed we are using to uh, derive new private keys for the new firmware. All the other keys, the intermediate private keys, for example, could be discarded after we issue the next level of the intermediate cert or the, C, or the leaf CS, um, or the leaf cert. And for the leaf cert, we need to keep the private key accessible by the firmware. So the firmware can use that to implement uh, security protocols with the remote verifiers. Um, so there are other solutions to this problem. Uh, for example, um, the ROT could also implement the PCR registers, and uh, the PCR could be uh, paired with a journey log. The journey log would recall all the firmware IDs uh, for this uh, update history. Um, in this case, the verifier would retrieve the PCR value, which is uh, somehow signed by the uh, uh, ROT searching, 
and also retrieve a plain text uh, journey log to verify the journey log against the PCR and examine the journey log, see if any uh, vulnerable firmware, bad firmware has ever run here. And then uh, it will do the security protocol. Um, so in that solution, you will have to implement a dedicated protocol uh, to retrieve the uh, firmware update history here. Uh, in our solution, we try to avoid that. Uh, we, we, we try to embed or include this uh, history within this uh, certificate. Um, so it's fully compliant with X509. So the verifier doesn't need to do anything special. It just validates the uh, IoT uh, searching as before. Um, and it's uh, not requiring any new protocols uh, due to the phone update history retrieval, saving some integration costs with the verifier. And there's no new hardware like PCR required here, saving some engineering cost. Um, and the revocation as well. So in, the, in our case, the revocation happens naturally with the uh, certificate uh, validation. So we don't require any uh, RAM revocation, for example. Um, of course, there are some cons with our method. Uh, apparently, the size of the searching is growing with the number of phone updates you have. Um, so that requires some storage on the host. Um, and we would need additional signature generation for every phone update. And the verifier would do additional signature verification when it's verifying the searching. So that may be performance uh, penalties there. Uh, key takeaway, uh, I think similar to last slide. Um, so we are trying to resolve this uh, phone update history retrieval attestation problem within the framework of current PKI and, S and, and the S509. Um, we believe the RFC 5280, the PKI, has provided enough flexibility for us to embed the uh, ID, phone ID into the searching and, and also to the revocation. Um, and we don't require any changes on the verifier, no changes on a CIL server, no uh, requirement for RIM server. Um, the, all the changes are within the uh, silicon, within our ROT implementation. So that will save a lot of uh, integration work also. Uh, Trade-off is the larger storage and uh, potentially slower performance. Um, so we have this idea here, share with the industry, uh, we welcome partners to uh, perform security analysis on our proposal and any ideas for optimization. Um, we're working on uh, implementation of the POC also. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested in further investigation and exploration, welcome to uh, come to us and we can talk more about it. Questions? More of a comment than probably some questions. Uh, you described uh, two ways of encoding the ID of the firmware and certificates. One of them is to use an existing uh, 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 methodology, and the other was to put the ID into the serial number. Uh -uh. Putting the subject, which is the identity of what you're certifying, into, this, into the serial number will not be X509 compliant. Uh, and you ought to, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure how it matches in practice. If you ever lose the private key and have to reissue the cert with the same serial number, you've now got two certs out there with the same serial number, and that's also bad news. So I would encourage you to think carefully through what you really want to do for um, identity of the firmware, because while putting it into the serial number is a clever hack, it's, re it, it's, it's just a little bit too clever, and you've got to go do, to go do something else a uh, place to dig is to go in uh, X509 and also uh, I think 5280. You'll find information on how to encode the identity you really need into a field called subject alt name. Yeah, um, the reason we considered serial number as the place to put the phone ID is for revocation. Uh, so the CIL entry requires the issuer name and the serial number. So if you want to um, revoke the firmware by serial number, then the serial number should reflect the firmware ID in order to use the CIL. Disagree. Uh, here's your problem. Suppose I have a firmware, I've issued certificates against it, and I've lost the private key. The private key is compromised. That cert now needs to be revoked. 
and I need to issue a new one for the same firmware that needs to have a different serial number, otherwise the CRL entry revokes both the compromised certificate and the new certificate. Okay, uh, I think it depends on when you say the f private key is uh, compromised, that's due to a firmware bug or a hardware compromise? It, it, it really doesn't matter. You're dealing with a security <coughs> architecture that is designed to deal with scenarios in which the private key is lost. It doesn't matter how it's lost. Revocation, revocation is what is used when you lose a private key. So in our case, the, cost, uh, the root cost really matters. If it's a firmware bug, we really need to revoke that firmware. In, in this case, what really matters is getting out of this tar pit and don't, don't abuse uh, the serial numbers certificate for a purpose that it was never intended for. Any other questions? My question was, if you're not, I'm over here. Um, <laughs> um, if, if you're not storing the certificate on the chip, what mm -hmm. exactly are you storing in the chip, in the ERG? Um, so the searching can be stored on the for example, the host proxy software, right? So the certificate, uh, once issue, it's not going to change. But how do you prevent it from rolling back to a previous search chain? Um, so the, uh, uh, the uh, ROT st uh, still stores the uh, intermediate private key to issue the next search. Yeah, so there's a s key storage on the ROT. So the private key is maintained in the uh, ROT. Only the s certificate um, is in the host. Okay. Um, so let's say you issue firmware version C, but the chip doesn't know that it has seen version C before. Is it possible to go back to version B or earlier? Because you have no knowledge of anything other than private key. Um, oh, okay. We uh, we also store the hash of the uh, previous firmware too. So we generate the in, in, uh, intermediate private key from the current firmware, and the seed. So the current firmware's uh, hash is stored there. Uh, so let me see if I can understand the question. So uh, you're I, asking what is gained by uh, having both the leaf and the, the intermediate both certs. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess. Um, uh, the, the intermediate, uh, what I heard him say was the intermediate tells you that this is bad, uh, and it's bad even if it's not running. And the leaf was, it's only bad if it's running. And I think, so, sorry, I think this is a really good question, but we actually had to go to the next talk, but yeah, thank you. Let, 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 yeah, let's talk, no problem. 